Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. I'm super thrilled to have a really good new friend that I can have these best conversations. So we decided, oh my gosh, let's hit record a while so that we can give you the behind the scenes. So I have with me right now, Jess Johnson, and she specializes in weaving together your emotional well, you say better than I do. Share share what you just said because that was so good. We should have hit record then. Yeah, absolutely. I teach people how to emotionally regulate their bodies while so they can think clearly. So I yes. combine nervous system work, calming the body with mindset coaching, so you can think about your emotions in a different way. Because I do differentiate between emotions and feelings. Ooh, well, let's start with that. What is the difference? Emotional. Emotions are like a physiological response in your body. And often when we feel that, whether it is like that sense of shame that often lives in our chest, I know that certainly lives in my chest or yeah. like anxiety that often for me lives in either my throat or my stomach. And when I am able to feel those sensations in my body and think about them differently, I feel differently about having anxiety. I feel differently about having shame. And I also teach a lot about having an empowered mindset versus a positive mindset. Because really when you understand that you are what you are in charge of and kind of be able to accept the rest, you're able to kind of loosen that hold that sometimes happens when we misinterpret what the body is telling us and our brain hijacks yes. the so if we don't have that, um, if we don't have that awareness with our bodies and we're just all in the think mode, right? So I'm a trained cognitive behaviorist, right? We're so just for everybody to know too, Jess is, Jess was a therapist, as you know, I was a therapist. So we met and we've talked a little bit about like the difference in the industry of therapy versus coaching. And also we're going to really talk today, um, and focus on what it's like to make a transition, what it's like actually to be an employee, to go to an aunt, be an aunt entrepreneur and how do we really call our own shots woven in there? We both have a mad love for all things, personal development and, and how we feel. And of course our body. So the question back to is like, well, how can we can just think ourselves out of this? Well, because a lot of our emotions come from childhood, childhood yeah. is, and we were taught or we learned from either our parents or grandparents, church, TV, like whoever were our authority figures at the time. And when we think about moving through life as an adult, this is something I see so often. I see people who are familiar with personal development work, whether it uh, is other therapists or coaches or yeah. just who, like read a lot. And yeah them say all the time, like, logically, I know I shouldn't be thinking this anymore. Logically, I know this isn't my fault. And then that starts them on a whole other level of like kind of putting shame on top of shame because they're making it a problem that their body still feels this yeah, way. Right. It's recognizing that, especially when you find yourself, like you, you're, you're doing a lot of work and you feel like you're using your coping skills and yet you're still having kind of these emotional reactions, like right. thing I always want to tell people is that our emotions are not our enemy. They serve as information. Right. And we are able to kind of choose the space and grace to take a step back and ask ourselves, what is this anxiety telling me today in this moment? Never ask anxiety in general what it has to tell you because it's going to give you all the things terrible. It's going to give you all the stuff you don't want to know or hear, right? <laughs> Being able like know really what specifically in this moment is this sensation in my body have to tell me and and does it remind me of something instead of making it a problem that you are still feeling it because yes. I have a useful emotion believe it or not it exists to tell us where we need to put our attention but if we are constantly interpreting anxiety as danger bells, something is going wrong. I need to stop whatever I'm doing instead of, oh, done a lot of work on this anxiety. And now I'm getting ready to get up and, and give a speech in front of hundreds of people. And now I'm feeling anxious. 
oh my God, there's a problem. Instead of, oh, anxiety is here to tell me that this is something worthwhile. And of course, I don't want to mess it up. Thanks for letting me know that anxiety. We're not going to. We really know our shit. Sorry, we're allowed to say that. Oh, yeah, we're allowed to pass. It's okay. (laughs) Well, I agree with you. I think that when we, it's it's the same with fear, right? When people are afraid to do something, try something new or what have you, um, or up level wherever they are, and they're going to this new thing. And of course, the, you know, innate and inherent in that is something new is probably going to trigger some kind of response, right? That we had conditioned and, and how do we, and you said anxiety and I talk a lot about fear. It's like, how do we make friends with that? And, you know, and how do we like, uh, for example, like I love, and this is not a question that I posed that I was going to tell you that I, I have this reaction and maybe this is just me. So whatever you say, you know, when people are like your inner bitch or your inner, like, and I'm just like, I don't find that helpful or useful. I think that it compounds the problem, you know, instead of like, whether it's making friends with or acknowledging or honoring, like our physiological responses are designed. That's the way we're designed as humans. And like, why would we bash something? It's, it's about learning to live with it, acknowledge it, but not from that. Like, you know, I'm, I like, you know, get angry with it. Like, I don't understand that as a concept. I just, I just, what are your thoughts around that? No, I, I love that you said that. I feel the same way because I believe the solution to anything in life is being able to uh, access self-compassion. Yeah. Any kind of name calling is not compassionate for me. I don't even love like joking around calling friends bitches. Like I just, to me, I don't, I am a very lighthearted, playful, fun human being, but that to me is not funny. Don't call me name either. I don't. Yes. Yeah. Why would I call me a name? I'm not going to do it even in lightness. And I know like people can be like, Oh, it's just a joke. It's just light. I'm trying to reclaim this. Like, uh, we are up against so much societal conditioning. I know what bitch means all my parts, right. In the collective that is Jess right. would know that on any level, it's still a put down. It's not, yes. it's, why would I do that? Yes. Totally agree with oh, you. I'm so glad because it, it's, t- you know, or whether it's even like in an entrepreneurial world, right? People are like boss bitch and all that kind of thing. And I'm like, mm, that's what we've been fighting for, you know, fighting against as women, right? To be strong, assertive, speak our mind and have that now meaning that we're being bitchy. So that's like maybe another conversation, but still it's kind of all in the same kind of thing, right? It's just like being conscious of what are we saying out loud and what are we saying to ourselves and how is that beneficial to ourselves and actually to the world? Like, how are we perpetuating a problem when we're like, Hey bitch, how's it going? Like, I don't know. That to me feels like whether it's joking or not, that perpetuates a problem. So Yes. And I agree with you. We can go down. There's a whole other rabbit hole. (laughs) (laughs) I love all our rabbit holes. That's really good though. So (laughs) let's talk a little bit about um, the entrepreneurial journey, right? So working with, you know, women who have, have had, you know, whether they like, I've been an entrepreneur since I, before I graduated high school, I moved out of the house before I graduated high school and supported myself. So, you know, so I've always been in the money making, doing something like this field. Most people aren't. Now that doesn't mean that I still haven't had a job, right? As a clinician, I had a job. Even when I did interior design, I worked for somebody for a while. So I did managed care. I sat behind a desk in a cubicle, like let's pause. Can you imagine right now going and being in a cubicle? So for those of you who are listening that are in a cubicle, we want to help you get the hell out. But right. Can you even imagine? Right. I'd like, I literally can't how, and that transition though, from people who have a job that, and then go into their entrepreneurial journey, that's a moment. That's an identity shift. That's a transition. There's a lot that goes behind that. I'd love for you to share yours, um, your history a little bit, because it's not just that you were a therapist, you were in the U S army. So you're a veteran. Thank you for your service. And like, that's a big ass shift, right? I mean, my husband's a retired Marine. So that indoctrination about working as a team and like all of the hierarchical type of things. And then for him, now he has his own business, right? Like, I, 
because of my business, he's able to do things. And it's been a shift. Like it's a different identity showing up, selling yourself, number one. And, you know, whether we want to call it not having stability with a paycheck, like what were some of the moments that you had that helped you decide that you were all in on being done being in the army as a clinician? Yeah. So I think a couple of things served me, right? This is like kind of part of who I've always been is like, you know, before now I kind of learned to, now that I've learned to be more intentional prior to this, I would describe myself as pretty impulsive, right? I'm kind of acting on a whim, following an adventure, um, wanting to do something different. I have grew up also in the military. Both of my parents served in the military. My dad did 32 years. I moved I up, I grew up overseas. And one of my close friends and a previous roommate in the army, like we used to joke about how when you're an army brat, you either get like the nomad gene or the stability gene. And mm-hmm. I definitely got one, my brother got the other. So I got the like kind of adventure nomad kind of restless gene, whether that is in career or in like uh, what I do, choose to do, how to spend my personal time. And so when I make decisions, I tend to like make them pretty quickly and act on them pretty quickly, especially big decisions. Now you give me like a tiny decision, like choose between these three places for dinner. I might be crippled with indecision. (laughs) Girl that you want, big shit needs to happen. I am there and I am calm and I'm steady and there's no second guessing myself. And so probably the biggest thing, the decision that I ever made, even before getting out of the army was when I went into the army because I was a non-traditional age. I was 32 when I decided to commission into the army. So not only like I left an established career, I worked in corrections, mental health and corrections prior to that. Um, like all of my family, like my friends and everything were in Frederick, Maryland, where I'm from. And so at that time I can look back on things and, you know, it was before I was a coach. I was definitely just like kind of fleeing, chasing adventure. I loved my life in my town, but I could just look down the road five, 10, 15 years and see exactly how my life would be. And it was fine. 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 Oh, is that your favorite word ever? It's fine. I swear it's fine, Mary. I swear, Jess, it's fine. Right. Yeah. It just felt like settling, right? And yes. like it, I knew I wanted to just do something different. So I started looking into government jobs first. And then during the course of that for therapy, I realized, oh, I can join the military. I can do three years of anything and joined, loved it, did five years, and then actually had a pretty profound experience with coaching. And so again, very quickly made the decision to get out of the military and pivot to coaching. Knowing that, of course, like I made the decision quickly to get out of the military, but it, it's not like your two weeks notice, right? It took me 13 months to transition out of my notice, get it, get all the pr- approvals done. Um, and so when I really think about that, I, I just think I've done this terribly scary thing. Of course I can do this thing. Yeah. And so whenever you can like pull on other scary things that you've done and show yourself how you've gotten through them, you can apply that. You have evidence that you can do scary things. You exactly. Can in here. So when I got out of the military though, I still wasn't, I, I had at this point finished up a coaching certification. Um, it never occurred to me to hire a coach though. I was like blind. When I look at that time, I was just, I was kind of trying things, but not really getting like what I wanted to do. I just didn't have any clarity. And then I kind of fell into this, a dream job of mine, which was coaching veterans, facilitating retreats, coaching veterans in like the wilderness, doing these wilderness programs. Oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. It was incredible. I learned so much there. It gave me so much more confidence. So then when COVID happened and I kind of, um, one of my friends recommended me to the business coach that you and I met through now. Um, and somehow like listening to her and I heard this thing called 
general life coaching. And it just gave me permission to own, I am a life coach. And I just kind of told you before, like how I did that for myself and why it was so quick is because I just was like, you know, when I was a therapist, I never stumbled around like tripping over, I'm a therapist. Oh my God, what if they ask me like who I therapize or like whatever, right? right? <laughs> yeah. I would just say I'm a therapist and the people who cared to have a conversation with me would be like, oh, what kind of therapist are you? Oh, what kind of people do you work with? Oh, tell me about like your the most favorite breakthrough you've ever heard, right? And like literally that second helped me just flip a switch and just start standing in this power of I'm a life coach. And when you start, when you yourself make this decision that, that this is my identity, this is who I am, something changes, your confidence, your tone, the way you stand. No longer was I introducing myself as, oh, I'm a, um, oh, am I, I'm a life coach, but I was a therapist, but like- I wasn't, was and I, let me qualify it by saying- Right, I get it. I totally get it. I'm always like giving this thing Right. And I might tell people, oh yeah, this started, you know, with my background in therapy, but really it, it's, if it is like relevant to the conversation, it's no longer in the introduction. It's yeah, I'm a life coach. And then when people, oh, how did you get interested in that? Oh, well, I was doing therapy and here are some of the trends I noticed. And here's the impact. Here's my story of how profoundly it impacted me. And so it is simultaneously as easy and hard as making a decision and just stepping into that and knowing the brain's going to do what the brain's going to do, which is panic and tell you all the right. things. And once we know what's going to happen. So what do you think about, you know, when people, whether it's a, whether, you know, whether I've been working with new people or even seasoned people and they're up leveling or they're firing staff or they're changing their rate or whatever, it's this moment where there's a shift, right? We can call it a shift in identity. We could call it up leveling. We can call it making a decision, but there's a hesitancy. And I don't think we, most people, except you and I do the work all the time, right? Are not taking the time to actually re validate that they can have success. Yes. That, that historically I do an exercise with clients, like list a hundred successes. And of course they can list all their like degrees and stuff, but it's also like other things that you've done in your entire life. Right. And, and so we have to give our brain evidence that we have had a process of success. I guess, you know, that what I heard you say was that you were impulsive, but when you make a decision, you act on it. Right. And, and I think that like a lot of times, I'm sure you've noticed too, that people necess don't necessarily trust themselves to make a decision and follow through with it or whatever the fallout is. And so to me, part of their identity is is whether we want to call it insecure or unsure or whatever it is, it smells like that. Right. And so, but part of being an entrepreneur, I don't know about you, but we got to jump in like the pool. It's, we got to jump in feet first. It's not tiptoe. I know that some people are like, do a side hustle, but I, I, I don't know for me personally. And it sounds like for you too, right. There's got to be a moment when you've just like decided and you're all in. Yes, absolutely. You cannot be wishy-washy. You cannot um, yeah, kind of flirt or entertain anything else. It is the decision. And for me, it is even further down from that when it comes to, because I coach a lot of people on trust, on self, because I am emotions expert. I coach a lot of people on emotions and how to integrate their mindset work or their thought work faster it is about, um, you and I talked earlier about acknowledging those parts of us, acknowledging that fear, getting to know it, like uh, kind of normalizing that it's there without making it mean anything. Yes. The important part of that after that though, is like acceptance. Yeah. That fear is always going to be there. Some anxiety is always going to be there. Some self-doubt is always going to be there. It is there to let us know we are doing something scary and there is there are stakes involved. Right. Being able to know the difference between the type of fear that is like, oh no, shit, I really do need to like take a step back and make right. sure I'm like run, run, right. Yeah. And the type of fear that is like, okay, this is fear. I can put it in the trunk with the rest of the baggage, not in the driver's seat or controlling or even navigating. Yeah. Right. I want it to be sometimes we talk, I languages like put it in the passenger seat. No, I don't yeah. want it. 
me either. I want it in the trunk with the rest of the baggage. I know you're there. I got to unpack you at some point. Right. And it's in charge of deciding when I get to unpack you. Because, you know, this is what is, I believe is required, right? As we are um, navigating everything, because back to being an employee, right? And even if you were employee or or even if you had your own clinical practice or what have you, you know, there's something new when there's something that happens when you are then become the actual thing you're selling. Like there's so much triggers in that, like who am I, imposter syndrome, blah, blah, blah. Like we can rattle down the list of things. And it, it is back to that trust. It's back to that vulnerability. It's back to being able to feel the feelings that, you know, that sure I could sell this widget because it belongs to somebody else. But today me talking about like, Hey, buy my thing. It's me. I know I'm an expert. Like most people, most women never claim their expertise. Most women never claim, or let me, I, I let me back up from using never or all or nothing talk. Right. What I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too, is that, that there's a moment where we've been conditioned that we don't claim something. We don't necessarily put the stake in the ground. And by you going from, you know, a corrections officer and getting out of the army and then, you know, having your own coaching business now, like you've had to make these, these stakes in the ground. And what is part of your like mental process, right? Because I don't think most people actually sit down and think about not just what they're feeling, but they actually don't think it through like, Hey, you know, I can, I can actually do this. These are going to be some of the problems. These are going to be some of the things that are going to come up and they don't actually acknowledge that there is going to be a significant shift in your identity, but you've changed your identity a couple of times, right? Uh, and so most people hold on to it in the face of, they might be like you looking down the pike five or 10 years and being like, shit, this is what I'm going to do, but they still don't take the action. What do yeah. you think is the reason for that? Well, the, my reason or their reasons, like just what you've observed yourself and others. Well, in others, definitely it is like our fear reactions are completely different. And that's always rooted again in like childhood expectations and what we can handle yeah, right. making sure our body is safe. Right. Because I also, I want to be very cognizant of, you know, without getting too deep I mean, as I know, we're not talking about therapy stuff, yeah. but you know, the body holds the score in, in trauma and in significantly emotional events that happen to us when we're younger. Sometimes we think, I think the difference is not recognizing that you can still, A, we're all in, what, whether you want to call it a personal growth journey, which is what I resonate with versus yeah. a healing journey, or whether you resonate with the language of healing, like you, it's not like, it's a journey and it's healing and personal growth, which to me is like, right. There is no end to those things. And countless times I hear people say like, I've got to heal this before I move forward. And they're constantly yes. trying them to fix something instead of just allowing that yes. you've ever done is enough and you can start moving forward and you can be healing while doing that, moving forward, getting used to success understanding what celebration feels like. Those are the things that are going to help move you forward even further. And you can't do that while you're constantly looking behind you, thinking that there's something you need to fix. Oh my God, this is so good. I feel like that's another whole thing we could talk so much about. Uh, and what also comes up for me is I'm like, how many men are having the same conversation right now about their trauma? And we could talk all about like, well, that's because the majority of trauma, you know, the people, children who have had, you know, abuse are his obviously, you know, predominantly female um, and all of those kind of things. But case in point, I, it, you know, when I love that you said that, that, that when we're looking in the rear view mirror, like I've got to fix that before I move forward. It's like, we're, we're creating our own crises, even in that moment we're perpetuating and, and, and like, I don't resonate with, um, like the healing journey for me is personal journey. In fact, I actually say, I like to be on the edge of my own evolution. That's where I want to reside. And I want my clients to reside that way. I have just a really big, um, reaction to like, I am not a survivor, although I've had significant trauma. I just don't use that language. It just, for me, it just, it, to me, it just brings it all back up as opposed to 
I'm evolving, you know, and that gives me freedom. And like, when I think, when you, when we think we're evolving, that doesn't negate that there's stuff that I might be working on with my own therapist or what have you. It doesn't negate that, but it's propelling forward. And I think that's part of coaching that we both like, right. It's about where, where are we headed and what's that journey toward that. And like the goal in and of itself is beautiful. And yet the, the journey along the way is the richness, the ripeness, the, um, you know, the, the experiential type of ex, you know, the experience of moving through things like that's the juice. Now I used to eye roll when people said that though, I don't know about you. When people were like, it's all about the journey and who you become along with. And I'd be like, ugh, because I was always like, just get me to the goal. Yeah. Now, now I can appreciate the journey because you can't get to the next thing without growth. Yeah. And the goal is always being like, or as I used to think it was, is like feeling better though. I got to be anymore. That's the end. Now that right. I'm, oh, no, the goal is knowing when, like how to treat yourself on the days where it's really, truly crappy. Yes. And not knowing, like not understanding, like part of my, like the journey that I'm still on today is um, really giving myself the credit for self-compassion does not mean like you baby, I baby myself. Yes. Passionate to myself when I stop and I nurture that part of me that's really terrified. I listen to what it has to say, and 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 within those moments, make a decision as to okay, do I need to back off this thing right now? Is there some more work I need to do somewhere, or is this a thank you? I hear you. We're gonna take a little step because we have so got this. Instead of nope, we have to go fix something. Oftentimes it's like, yeah, I'm still feeling pretty tender about this. And I also know I've got these fantastic coping skills and I know how to use support now and not feel like I've got to do it all on my own. Cause that is a huge thing that I think coaches and entrepreneurs and women tell themselves all. <laughs> well, because there's something like, if I ask for help, I don't know about you, but in my, I never asked for help because help always had like a backhand or some like string attached that I don't know whether it was worth paying the price for that, whatever was attached to the other end of that string, which I might not know in the moment of asking for help. It was like, no, not to mention, I think that also like culturally, like a middle-class mindset is like, if you can do it yourself, pull up your bootstraps and you kind of do it. So, you know, there's that. And of course it, as entrepreneurs, and we're in a world where we make money, we're around a lot of other women who make a lot of money. Like that's just an, another thing all in of itself. Not to mention that historically we were both clinicians and like the martyr, um, martyrdom of therapists who can't charge any money because blah, 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 all that. We don't need to go down that route, but um, but still the identity shifting to say, yes, I know something and I'm willing to charge for it. And I'm willing to charge as much as I decide it's worth. And the value that my clients are going to be like, I'm all in for that. Like that is a, that's, you can't get to that mo that point unless you're willing to be gentle with yourself and give yourself a little push. You got to have both things here. The two things I just want to make sure to circle back to just because a lot of times, and this is why I'm very cognizant of using emotions in my marketing that I teach people how to be an expert on their own emotions, because a lot of times people fail to realize that like trauma is an emotional response, right? And they hear the word trauma and they're like, oh, that's not me. Like there's, um, they, it's, it's a different flavor of compare and despair. Whereas like traditionally, we're used to like comparing ourselves to somebody who we feel is doing better and being like, yeah. oh my God, I'm not them. I'm never going to be them. We don't talk enough about the other type of comparison, which is, oh, I'm not as bad as that. I should be able to do this on my own then. I don't yeah, just, so good. This person needs it. <laughs> when the reality is the more any of us identify, we're all beings that are worthy and deserving of help and support and use that, the better we are for those around us in yes. our lives, for ourselves, with our like uh, clients, all of that has to come first. The work of understanding yourself, that deep work starts with you and everybody else will reap the rewards of that. And kind of one of the things um, 
just for anybody listening who might have heard your example just now be like, oh, okay, I don't have that kind of trauma. Therefore, this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, like, exactly. Sure. Me, it's like a lot of um, Irish culture. You don't let people know your business. Yeah. Right? Right. So like, that was like such a big thing for me. I can't talk about this thing because I grew up like just yes. don't tell, you don't let people see these parts of you. You let, don't let people know that you're struggling. You don't let people know that you might not be as strong as you think you are knowing, not knowing what I know now, which is I'm exactly as strong as I say I am. And my strength lies in my ability to seek support and ask for it and know what support I need and do the brave work of actually fucking doing the work. (laughs) Amen. I think that that nailed it, right? Is that, um, that there is bravery in, um, and there is being bold. My business is being bold as an acronym, brave, outgoing leader, deciding, deciding to have the life that you want, lead a life uncommon, et cetera. But there's bravery in saying that I can't do this all myself. Yeah. And that, you know, that's the point that that's the point when as service providers, we're offering people, we're, we're giving them a service that helps them see something that they may not be able to see and help them in a way that they might not. And that's exactly, so we have to be able to lead by example by asking for that support because there's things that we can't see, but that doesn't equate to there's something wrong with us. That doesn't equate to that we're weak. That doesn't, in fact, if anything, it's not, it's hypocritical not to get support when we're trying to offer support to people, right? And that us doing the work and being brave enough to do the work, like like you said, we're better for it. And frankly, if we want to, provide excellent service, we're actually better for our, for our clients. Yes, I um, constantly see oh. my clients through these eyes of admiration, but, but, but yeah, through a lens of admiration for them, because I know exactly what I'm asking of yes. them. Yes. Something new about themselves. I know exactly what I'm asking of them when I ask them to take the time to learn how to truly celebrate or embody a new feeling. And I know what that means. It means you're letting go of certain people in your lives. You're trusting that when you let go of those people, the types that want to yes. support you are going to, to come to you, right? There's they are there, right? Absolutely. And so every time like I ever like falter in like my belief as a coach, I immediately go into, instead of thinking that it's something about my business structure, I immediately go to like, where do I need support in this for myself right now? And I see that as a huge difference in um, what I see oftentimes with entrepreneurs. They constantly, and this might lead into your next question that, so I'm just going to give the question. Yeah, as I go end. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> in my um, making decisions on how to treat myself as an entrepreneur or something like that. And for me, it's always been like, I never want to make myself feel how I felt in the army without control, uh, so many things on my schedule that I couldn't take off, like not like literally not being able to manage things in a way that was aligned with me because so many outside forces were coming into play. And so for me, It's always like I put, I build my business around my life, not my life around my business. And because I predominantly coach a lot of service-based entrepreneurs and other life coaches, like just today, um, I was working with one of my clients on developing a self-concept, which is how you think about yourself, which will get you to take certain actions based on how how you view yourself and how you think. And she had said that she wanted to be somebody who prioritized having fun in her business. It was a little more detailed than that. And I was like, well, what might happen if you just swap out business for life? Yes. Part of your life. And if you think you're only allowed to have fun in your business, then what's going to happen if you don't prioritize it here too? Prioritize it in your life first. The business will come into place if you know that and you know that that's important to you. And I agree a thousand percent with you about that. Like build, a, design a life and build a business to fund it is one of the things that I talk about, right? It's so, and I think that people, it is, it's because, you know, there's so much marketing and, you know, we're, we're both 
great at our, our marketing and our copy that it's out there and it feels like there's always the other thing that's the better thing instead of investing time and looking at ourselves uh, and yeah. that we might know the better thing. And that, that thing that looks so shiny and freaking amazing. I'm not in denial about it, right? I bought all the things too at one time in my career, but it's just like, wow, what do I really want? And, and still, I think it is getting back to even learning to how to give ourselves permission to do what we want in the way that we want to, to, to even think that you can have a life and build a business that's going to pay for the lifestyle, et cetera, that you want, whether it's, you know, three houses, a private jet, or that you just want to work one day a week or whatever that looks like. I don't think there's not a lot of models out there for that historically, right? It's like nine to five, you go to school, you get your degrees and then it's nine to five. And there's, there's a whole other opportunity that's just available to us. It's yeah. incredible. Or just on the other side of that too, like it's the nine to five thing, or sometimes we fall into this pivot of, oh, it's the three day a week fun entrepreneur thing, right? And it's like, if there's like one thing I want to embark on everybody, it's like, let's live without labels. Yeah. Like, like get in tune with you, like things like imposter syndrome, oftentimes people are like, oh, I get it. This is imposter syndrome. And then they stop there just normalizing the imposter syndrome, but not realizing like something like that. What are you saying to yourself? What is your flavor of imposter syndrome? Right. And what are you telling yourself when you just dismiss? Oh, this is it. It's a normal part of business. It shouldn't be. Let's stop telling ourselves that that's an okay thing to go through and actually do the work to sit in that and like not yes. know. I, that is so good. That is so true. I feel like we, we should have a whole nother conversation about that. Um, I'm like, I have all these other questions that just come up for me. What, what I want to do is I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about EFT, right? Cause I know that you love that as a tool and that this is, you're certified in it and all the things, and we can end on this on how is it that, you know, what was the moment, right? It's kind of like, there's so many different modalities as we know. There's so many coaching modalities. Of course, there's so many clinical modalities, other somatic modalities. What was it and what is it about EFT that really has you have, like leading the way with, with teaching people and working with people about their emotions and about using this tool to, to truly change their entire lives? Um, so for me, so EFT stands for emotional freedom techniques, tapping cliff notes version is by tapping on these points in your body, energy meridian points, you're calming the central nervous system. So therefore by tapping on these points and placing your attention on a distressing thought or feeling or emotion, something you feel like you can't get over, uh, and combining that with an affirmation of acceptance, you're doing that your the work that we talked about that's so important. You're acknowledging and validating that you feel a certain way and you are accepting yourself even with that. So it's not about like, oh, I'll accept myself once this thing's gone. Yes, right. Really, like I accept myself even with all that. So cliff notes thing for anybody who doesn't know. And for me, I had been coaching for a bit um, about two years, I would say, and in the corrections, I was a, th a therapist in corrections. I wasn't a corrections officer. So that's just the note there. So I've been a therapist, um, for God, dec over a decade. And, um, and you know, just, I was still like kind of crippled with a bunch of stuff and anything energy, you said the word woo, you said yoga, you said meditation. I was like, well, that shit's weird. I ain't doing it. Right. And it wasn't until my back was against a wall with arachnophobia. Actually, I started this incredible job, loved it. It was my dream job. There was a spider infestation in the cabins when I started this. Um, oh, the retreats with the veterans, yeah. And somebody taught me the EFT points and it like, I'm not kidding. It was like somebody cast a spell on me because I have had profound arachnophobia my entire life. Even in wow. my, here there's a little spider, my tattoo sleeve, if you have, see a picture of me in my bio. Um, there was a little spider that was before I ever found EFT. This is how much spiders have impacted me. And this was supposed to be my little talisman against spiders. And so now it is a tal it is, it shows me my journey to EFT because it was such a profound, like, 
I worked there 18 months and the spiders were still there. Oh my God. Spiders. But I mean, I will tell you that I would think about spiders all the time. My husband will tell you about phones I've broken, iPads I've broken, things like shirts I've ripped off me, thinking that anything out of the corner of my eye or any sensation of something crawling on me, no matter, like I could be somewhere that was literally, spiders wouldn't be possible to be there. And I would freak out, like crying, like it was a thing. So for me to go from this place of that in two rounds, to be able to work in this place for 18 months and still have the spiders there was just, I mean, can you imagine that? Like something that was such a part of you for so long being suddenly gone. And so I started teaching it to veterans in terms of emotions, just teaching myself some stuff I saw online. And then, you know, because the internet spies on us all the time, I started getting ads for an actual certification in something called clinical EFT or uh, evidence-based EFT. And that is really helps us reprocess the way we experience our memories, which then loosens up the emotional hold that we have on them. So now I'm able to think about certain distressing events and not feel like I'm right back in that moment. And so EFT has just been such a profoundly life altering way for me to have had such a shift myself And then when I started combining it with mindset work, like how I want to think about myself, it just started integrating things so much. And so with my clients, I'm always hearing, logically, I know I shouldn't think this anymore. And then when we work together to help them, A, understand what their emotions are trying to tell them, and then use EFP to restructure those early experiences and memories that had caused it to be such a painful emotion that it's really scary to um, do that on your own there. It, it just something, a piece of them integrates into the whole and they are feel differently about everything. And so I like to use a lot of like time travel analogies in my marketing. Sometimes I joke that I am emotions expert and I'm a time traveler. I know. I love that. <laughs> uh, excellent adventure quote in my website. And, you know, I just think that's fun. And one time, one of my clients described it to me as she felt as though Um, we had gone back and restructured something so much for a younger version of her that she actually went and lived an entirely different life and then met up with my client where she is in this moment. And that helped her feel even better because not only was she carrying around the pain of what had happened, but she was like, I also feel like I just gave myself a chance to have a whole new life. And now we just Mm. met she feels how I do right now. I've got goosebumps talking about this without all the difficult learning that I had to go through. Yeah. And so for me, I always come back to that, how profound that is. And I blanket say, yes, like EFT, but I'm certified in like a couple different energy techniques that fall under the EFT blanket. So rather than um, try to explain that to people, because they don't care. They just care that I can help them feel better. Exactly. Right. Well, really it's a series of energy modalities, but EFT, I'm also teaching them basic EFT at the same time. So that is a tool that they know how to use forever. Forever. In thinking of constraint, again, that's why it's so important to also have understand mindset techniques and how we choose how to feel because that has been such a effort on my part because absolutely first starting out learning EFT, I got to learn all the things, all the modalities and I got to market and I got to talk, people need to know and I just made a decision that I would rather be a master of something than a jack of all trades. Yes. This is where my, my, I am just an expert in, and there might be things that I do personally that I explore because I think it's fun, um, different other energy modalities or even mindset things. But like, for me, it's the EFT that has allowed the door to open on anything else. And so when you learn how to calm your central nervous system and rest- and understand your emotions, doors open for you in, in anything you might want to do. And you're able to make decisions from a different place of clarity, period. 
to speak my punctuation sometimes. <laughs> That's good. I love that. And this is what's required, isn't it? That for us to have the success that we want, for us to feel good about ourselves, for us to build businesses if we want to, for us to create this new identity. Like you said, your client created this new identity. Like this, like I call it, being on the edge of your own evolution and doing this work and uncovering all these things, like this is the greatest gift that we can give ourselves and the world. I mean, I like we're here in this blip of moments, you know, of time. And, and there's so much richness that people just hold back. And, and if they just gave themselves permission to even get to know them themselves better, like that, even just that is the beginning. And I know that's so much of the work that you love to do, like that connection that you have with your clients. You don't take that for granted. It's like a, a gift. Absolutely. And I love it. I, I adore it. And, the, and I get so earnest about it and I don't even care. I used to think like, oh my God, you're so earnest. People are going to think you're like a little puppy dog jumping around. Fuck it. I am. This shit's a thing. And life is so different and how you experience the hard things is so different. And I also don't subscribe to life as 50, 50. I think that's a weird little thing to teach. I believe that there's like, you know, moments of crap embedded, but when we like think anything needs to be half, like 50, 50 of anything, it's still like setting us up for something. There's shit that happens. I, I personally call it balance is bullshit. That's what I've always said my whole life. Right. Because I think like what you said is when we have that as a construct, whether it's 50, 50 or balance that we're setting ourselves up for innate failure, because, you know, we're seeking to strive to something and then we're dismissing a moment and then almost waiting for the next shoe to drop because, you know, and then, you know, it's just, I don't know, like that, like I've never uh, thought that when people are like, I just like to live in balance. I'm like, I don't, I don't know that that's a thing. Totally. Like waiting for the other shoe to drop. I love how you put that. That's so true. It teaches people. I work with so many people with this limiting belief that I've got something good. That means I got to give something. This doesn't come without right. yes. people interpret that as, and what a, what a sad way to like, to live. Right. Like I like to think of like harmony instead of balance. That's what I use too. I use harmony and seasons. Like well, there's seasons in life. Like, you know, some people are old, some people are young. Some people have some kids, some people like all the things. And, and if we live in harmony, I don't know. I'm very like the, the wooey nature part of me that I don't necessarily lead with. Like, I mean, if we actually just look around and we like let, let nature, you know, give us some guidance also, it's like, there are seasons. And what if we allowed ourselves to recognize the seasons of life or even the seasons in business, right? Some, some um, niches are busier than others. Like if you know that, like, then you don't have to be stressed out because it's June and nobody's buying your thing or whatever. It's January. You better know you're busy if you have a club, a gym. So it's like, then you get to actually be what, what pe most people want, quote, quote, I'm air quoting, right? In control of their life and their calendar. So if you can start learning even your own harmony, your own vibes, when you start to do that and you can honor them because there's times that I want to be really busy and there's times that I don't. And, you know, this is back to making these choices to get to know ourselves and, and set ourselves up for the best success that we can individually as just people. But yeah, that whole balance or 50, 50, I mean, I just, yeah, I'm not a subscriber to that. The magic of entrepreneurship too, is that we get to make our own seasons, right? This yes. don't have to follow traditional weather seasons that we're talking about. You and I are talking about the seasons that we create exactly in tune with our alignment in our cycles. Like I go through so many phases. I used to, and here's another nuance of how we talk about ourselves, right? I used to, you've probably heard me say this, joking around about how I'm consistently inconsistent in my marketing. I kind of realized fairly recently that is not serving me because yeah, I was going to say, I, when I heard you say that, I was like, I don't know if I know her well enough to be like, you might want to reevaluate that. But what did you, what was your aha of late? Totally have. Like now I'm just like, that's not serving me. I am consistent. This is consistency for me. And sometimes right. I'm on fire and I will churn out four reels in a day and they're amazing. And I think they're so helpful. And they, and I don't worry about, oh, I got to put this in drafts and like schedule it. Nope. It's going to get out right now because I have full trust. It's going to help somebody in this yes, moment. Yes. 
it just loses. I believe like when you're posting or when you're writing something, there's something about the power of the moment that you're doing it in. Just put it out there, trusting that that shit's not going to go away. Internet, for good or better, for worse, it's staying there forever. And so it's out there. Somebody is going to trip over that when they need to, and it's going to lead them to me. And then I might have four days where I don't post at all. And it's not because I'm in a low value cycle and feeling filled in my business. It's because I'm doing other shit or my business that's more impactful at the time, because I am the one that determines that season or that cycle. And because we do have to be really conscious too of like what we're labeling, whether we're labeling something like a low value cycle or I just seek balance or whatever it is, we have to be, or like I have anxiety and I'm always, ang- at, you know, or I'm depressed or winter's coming, you know, I'm going to get depressed. It's like, well, fuck, like, you know, or, you know, I didn't post for four days. So that means no one's going to like all of these things. It's like, uh, sometimes we just need to chill out a little bit and allow ourselves to listen to how we want to navigate things and, and recognize that if you keep doing the same old pattern, there's probably something that you might need to work on. And if you're really being mean to yourself, and if you're not taking some time to do something a little differently, that that's going to be your life. Right. And, and, and that it's okay that as entrepreneurs, like you said, we get to design what we want to do. Like, isn't that, that why we don't like, I will, I could never work for somebody ever again. I literally, like I would sell both houses that my car, like I would sell all my assets, never to have to work with somebody. It's like, you get to choose. I think that, you know, we're both saying we, we want everyone who's listening to choose for themselves for God's sake. Yeah. And if you need help, hire one of us. Yes. And so let's leave on that. Let's end on that. Tell everyone where they can reach you. Absolutely. JessJohnsonCoaching.com is my website. And you can find me on Instagram at, at seeking a great, perhaps one, the number one on Facebook, Jess Johnson coaching services. Um, reach out or email me, get on my email list. That is the best way to keep track of things that I'm doing because I'm getting ready to do something that I've never done before on, um, what is that after Black Friday, Small Business Saturday. And I'm gonna be releasing something only to people who are on the waiting list. So you'll want to be on my email list to get access to that. And if you wanna email me at justjohnsoncoaching.com and just say, hey girl, heard John Mary's amazing podcast, send me your link. And then I will. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, on that, I'm going to just ask you one last question, but you've kind of answered this the whole entire time. Like, what do you, does, what's your definition of leading a life uncommon? Yeah, I think it's being a breathing example of what is possible. Mm. Oh my God. And it is like, that chokes me up. Choosing realize so viola davis just gave this amazing quote on this show called hot ones the other day and he asked her said the privilege of life is being who you are what do you think of that quote and her response was i think you just dig you you're put on this world it doesn't make a lot of sense to you and you have to answer the call to adventure and if you're not listening to that voice deep inside of you you're gonna miss it and that like i have goosebumps i could get here i'm gonna start crying because that is totally it like everywhere. It is such a powerful, powerful thing. Like what I believe, like the privilege of life is being who you are and it is an adventure and it is answering the call and it is brave to do so. So do it. Amen. Well, with that, thank you so much for being here. I love our conversations. Bye everybody.